Hi everyone and welcome to the Jeff Buller Show. Today I have with me Dan Englander. Now Dan is uh, in the USA and I'm in Sydney, Australia. And a little bit about Dan before we dive into uh, some of his uh, experiences and what he's learned along the way. Dan is the founder and CEO of Sales Schema. Uh, it's an agency that helps B2B companies customise their sales and marketing processes so they can win big fish clients and scale more efficiently. I do like the idea of scaling. It's uh, dear to my heart as well. Currently, Dan and his team have executed over 7,000 campaigns, won millions in lifetime revenue, and generated 3,000 plus agency brand meetings for clients with companies like Birchbox, Stripe, and Venmo. Previous Dan was the first employee head of new business at Idea Rocket, where I think he uh, earned his stripes, and, uh, and before that, account coordinator at DX Agency. He's the author of Mastering Account Management, and the B2B sales blueprint. Now, apparently in his spare time, he enjoys developing new aches and pains via Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So, uh, a bit of a martial artist, is that, is that it, Dan? Uh, to, to some degree, yeah, middling <laughs> at best. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I sort of never got into it. Uh, I suppose I considered myself a lover rather than a fighter, uh, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I hope I hope that one can be both, but you know. <laughs> oh yeah, I I totally that, don't think they're uh, mutually exclusive. Um, yep. So, Dan, what I'm curious about is what got you into building an agency to help clients in their B two B sales uh, outreach. Yeah. Where did, the, where did this start? So obviously it became a passion. Maybe as observer, observing, reading. Tell me how you sort of got into this area. Yeah, for sure. So for background, um, I started in the agency space. I moved to New York when out of college in like 2010. And then I always joke that if you don't know what you want to do and you, you move to New York, you just kind of end up in the, the rubble bin of the agency world. So I did that for a while, um, worked, you know, on some kind of bigger consumer accounts, led new business kind of from there through a Craigslist ad actually landed a job uh, as officially I was like an account manager, but I was essentially doing sales uh, and client service, kind of a hybrid role, selling um, creative services, animated video to, to mid to large brands. So I, I, I sort of, you know, didn't take ownership over being in sales at first, and then finally realized I needed to if I wanted to make any money and help the company and keep my job. Uh, so got trained up and tried, you know, every every tactic under the sun. Um, we, we did tons of inbound marketing, we did a lot of outbound, kind of made it work and, and really kind of figured out what it would take uh, to sell you know, a complex creative services product. And I think a lot of the times, a lot of the sales education is about tech or it's about something that's tangible. And I think uh, there, there, I didn't, felt like I didn't have enough instruction on how to manage a split sales client service role, how to juggle these things, how to sell something that's kind of abstract or complex. So I kind of went off my own. So like 2014, you know, I took the Tim Ferriss pill, like a lot of people did. Like, I think you, you mentioned earlier, Jeff, that you went a similar route. Um, and I, 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 you know, self-published a book about account management called Mastering Account Management. I got some clients um, to somehow pay me to give them advice about sales, which I can't believe they did that uh, at that stage. But, it, but anyway, what I kept finding was the main place I could help and the main thing, main area people were looking for help with was getting uh, the pipeline full, getting prospects in the door. And beyond that, most of the, the the people that would hire me in the area that I saw the most need for help was the agency space. You know, basically people selling complex marketing services uh, to mid to large companies, and that's essentially you know what we've done at Sales Schema since 2014 is just kind of work to keep the pipeline full, regardless of what our clients are, however busy our clients are, or, or whatever. And more recently, we've expanded out to other B2B services, other complex services like consulting uh, and some other verticals as well. Um, so I could definitely get into how that's changed since we started the company, but I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, yeah okay, cool. Um, I noticed one of the phrases that I, I read um, on your website uh, was, and in the bio that you sent through, was tapping into uh, executives of CEOs, tribes, or their extended networks. Um, and uh, tr and then, so but just about that because that's hard to scale, isn't it? It can be. Um, yep. It can be. And I think that, and to, to give a little bit of, of background, and then I can get into tactically, you know, how, how we're scaling uh, these campaigns out. Um, in the early days, you know, the early years of the company, I think we were doing 
what most people are doing when it comes to outbound sales, whether it's through a lead generation company or people doing it in-house. And that kind of looks like, you know, hey, I'm going to buy a list or build a list of the people I want to contact, whether that's a CMO or whoever you're going after. And then, you know, essentially run sales campaigns to them, maybe do drip sequences, maybe you're retargeting them and doing all these things. Um, I think that what's happened and it's accelerated recently, but it was already in the works is that we've essentially reached a very, very high point of market sophistication or skepticism um, about marketing services, right? And it's not just marketing services. It's most businesses that aren't brand new tech products, like most businesses that are service-based and you can do from a laptop from anywhere are becoming, you know, the, the perception is uh, is that they're commoditized. And even if they're not commoditized, there's a lot of mistrust about them. So the scarce commodity is, has become trust. And there's there's a whole lot about this. There's a great author I love named Gene Schwartz that talks about the stages yeah. of market sophistication. And I think that for marketing services, and there's exceptions to this, you know, there could be something new, like, hey, we do TikTok marketing or whatever, and that becomes new, but then it becomes old very quickly yeah. because of the internet. So I know I'm giving you a really roundabout answer. Um, That's good. But- but anyway, what we figured out is that, okay, and Gene Schwartz wrote all about the stuff in the 60s, and it's just as true to then, to today as it is then. And what he writes about is in this fifth stage of marketing sophistication, where you have the most aware buyers, the thing that works is identifying with them, right? Is building, building connections to them. And this segues perfectly with like Simon Sinek and all these other, you know, all these other gurus that have written about identifying with their customers. So all we've sort of figured out how to do is to do this from this weird little world of outbound sales. So uh, back to the scale question. Again, I think what most people are doing is backloading the work, right? You're going to spend not that much time buying a list, whoever you want to target, CMO of companies between X and Y size and this and that industry. That And then so there's not a lot, a, lot, a lot of work going into list building. All the work goes into building the drip sequence, right? Doing A-B tests, uh, figuring out the perfect message to market match and all these things. The way that we think think about it differently and the way that we're able to get scale is instead of going for that golden decision maker, we're identifying the accounts, that's important. So you wanna figure out what accounts our clients wanna to sell to. Um, but then we're identifying the people that share commonalities with our clients and are more likely to connect with our clients based on that commonality. So for example, it could be friends in common that, that tends to work really well. That's the thing as old as time. Hey, I saw you know Bob Smith, I know Bob Smith too. That's definitely a common thing, but it doesn't have to be that. Other campaigns that we do uh, might include, hey, hey, I saw you used to work at Coca-Cola. Now you're at Pepsi. We've done tons of great projects for Coca-Cola. We should connect. And there's probably another dozen or two dozen ideas that we've implemented and we're constantly coming up with new stuff. But there's a lot of these ideas. And even if people never hire us, they're out there listening. I think that if you start thinking about identifying those people that are likely to talk to you based on a commonality, it doesn't have to be anything weird, but just something um, and prioritizing them, then you're going to get a whole lot more relationships in the right accounts and you're going to move your sales process forward faster. There, there are ways to do that at scale. So that's kind of how we think about it conceptually. Okay. So and the tools we have today as compared to a decade or two decades ago, are much more sophisticated and much more, uh, the tech is so much better, isn't it? I did notice that. So, and I noticed one of your steps was, uh, it's quite simple really. Um, you spent a lot of time up front crafting um, a distinctive and creative campaign. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, I, and I think in terms of, of mindset, uh, what's been sort of sold to people is, and, and I, it makes sense that it's been sold to people like this because it's what everyone wants, right? Everybody wants the automated machine, right? The machine that you can turn on, set it and forget it, you flip a switch and then out comes the business till the end of time. Um, but if you think about it, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Like we're all selling things or not all of us, but you know, the people that our area is focused on people that are selling things that are uh, where the, the deal sizes are very lucrative, where there's lots of competition. So, so to answer your question, um, the way, uh, the way that we found to work well is thinking about things in terms of distinct campaigns, right? Where, where you might be thinking creatively and that campaign might last anywhere from several weeks to, you know, maybe up to a year at, at the most, but eventually you're going to have to rethink that and think about who are you contacting, how are you contacting them and what are you saying to those people? So that's kind of how we think about things. So do you create a customized one for every client or work with them to create that customized approach, that creative customized approach? 
Yeah, good question. So I, I think that uh, it's like a lot of our clients and a lot of agencies and, and service companies we work with. Uh, there's there's a lot of customization, but then there's also constraints. So it's kind of customization with con constraints. So the constraint is, you know, we're focused on outbound. That's really our specialty, um, which means a fancy way of saying, you know, knocking on knocking on doors in the right way and, and de-risking conversations. So in terms of that, um, another constraint is is most of our campaigns these days, this could evolve. We've worked with every channel under the sun, but right now it's email. Um, and that's that's another constraint, another thing that's the same for, for most of the clients we take on. Um, and I could go down a rabbit trail with email, but I think it's something that has not decreased in terms of, uh, of, of its influence. It's something we still use every day. It's 30 years going now. And it's a channel that we and our clients actually get to control versus with social media, there's pros and cons with uh, ad, ad networks and stuff, but there's more and more platform risk. And we've seen this play out time and time again, where I think it's getting more important to own the audience. Um, yeah. But to answer your question, uh, there, there's a lot of the customization comes into the connection that we're building for each client based on their, their business and or personal commonalities with the people they want to reach out to. So that's where we have a, a blank slate basically. Yeah. Okay. So once you've sort of crafted that and you're using email as your primary platform, and I, I totally agree with you, um, is that with the, we're in the middle of the battle of the algorithms, which means that we're all, everyone's changing algorithms all the time. So your SEO traffic can drop because Google changed the algorithm. Um, your right. email inbox goes to spam because Google's changed its Gmail algorithm. Um, Facebook changes its algorithm, so you're no longer reaching the people you want to reach. Um, so email is certainly still a channel you can own, and right. uh, I think that's really important. And you can earn it as well. So, uh, and you're right. I, I think a lot of people get sucked into the chasing the shiny new toys, shiny new platform, um, and you've got to be careful about that. It doesn't mean you don't do it, but <coughs> excuse me. Next part um, you mentioned is the next step after doing that crafting of that um, creative campaign and using email is targeted outreach. So what sort of tools do you use to find, look for those commonalities? You mentioned oh, we reached out to you because we saw you worked at Pepsi and Coca-Cola and we've done a lot of work for Pepsi and four. Uh, and commonalities could be even things like, well, we both were in the Tim Ferriss 4 hour work week, right? So, uh, or you know connection. So how do you go about you know, doing that targeted outreach and what tools do you use to do that? Yeah, it's a good question. And at the risk of sounding coy, uh, we draw from a lot of different wells uh, and that's <coughs> where, and the other thing is we're building lists currently, like basically in real time to fit each campaign. So, um, you know, some of it's proprietary, blah, blah, blah. We're not saying how we're doing it in any given situation, but to be yeah. less cagey, um, we might be drawing, we might be pulling data from trade associations in one campaign and another campaign we might be pulling data from bios and company websites. We might be pulling from event pages. We might be pulling from, you know, just other other outside data sources. We might be buying a niche list combined with any of the above. We might be pulling from all the above plus LinkedIn. And we have around 15 list builders that we'll draw from to make this happen. So that's where a lot of the uh, the painstaking work goes to yeah. getting this data, scrubbing it, making sure it's it's usable, and then putting it into you know, a very natural looking email, which is something I can, I can talk more about. Um, but I think that, you know, even if you, if you never hire us and, you know, you don't buy into all the crazy processes we have and stuff, if you're doing this on your own, um, a lot of it, you know, can come from really starting from the foundation of who you know already, you know, LinkedIn will let you export your first three connections. And then from there you can say, okay, well, here's all the people out of hundreds or maybe thousands that I'm connected with that I could ask for an intro. Um, and then batching up an email to those people. You'd be surprised, like almost nobody is doing that systematically. Most people yep. are networking and kind of taking years to network. I did that. I played that game for, you know, several years at a time going to morning networking groups when I could probably, I mean, it's, it's an exaggeration. There's benefits to networking beyond just the sales, but um, I could have shortcutted that process, you know, over the course of a few months, probably by just hitting up people I'm already connected with. So. Um, so, so anyway, there, there's a lot of places we're drawing from and I could, yeah, I could get further into that. Okay. Um, so what you're talking about then is that you're networking with a purpose and you're using tools rather than just turning up to a breakfast event where they're going, uh, here's my card, here's your card. Um, and we sing Kumbaya and you never catch up. Um, that used to be the old way of doing it. And I used to go, I went to a few breakfast networking events and it's just like, I don't know, they just felt horrible. I really just... 
It just was not authentic at all. Um, yeah. So I really haven't doubled down on that at all because it just didn't feel right. So um, now you mentioned uh, email. So tell me a little bit more. Uh, and this will leads a little bit into tools as well and uh, CRMs and everything. So tell me a bit more um, about your strategy with email. I'd be interested about that. Yeah, uh, for sure. So I'm, I'll get to that, but just to kind of like add on to the networking group thing. Um, it's funny because I did that for years too and it didn't work for me. And I just assumed, oh, well, maybe I'm not that good at it. Maybe I'm not talking to enough people. But then I kind of noticed over time, it wouldn't work for anybody that was selling anything slightly weird, like any complex service, uh, it wouldn't work for. But the people that were just killing it, they were making you know, millions or whatever, uh, or some crazy, crazy amounts of money, uh, were, were in the real estate space in New York City where I was going to these networking groups. So the real estate people had this great little ecosystem and it'd be like, oh, you need title insurance? Well, I just got done with showing somebody a, a property and then the property person would give leads to the lawyer and then it was like a merry-go-round and they kept making money. Um, so I think the same dynamics work. You just have to do them digitally because you're not going to have enough quantity of opportunity in a sort of analog context. But when you expand out to the internet and use those tools, then it can go on on for a long time. Um, so that that's all we're that's off not all, but that's a big part of what we're doing yeah. is just trying to create those dynamics with you know the whole country or the whole city or the whole world or, or whatever. So, um, to, but to answer your question, uh, to get in to get into email. Um, like I, I was kind of talking about, I think that email, you know, to use you Nassim know, Taleb parlance is anti-fragile. It's only gotten stronger. Um, it sometimes it's the bane of our existence, but at the end of the day, it's where we, we do yep. business. It's where we do, it's where we get stuff done. Um, and, and I think it's also matured as a channel, right? Where I think a lot of ways um, people will tell me, Hey, we tried email, didn't work for us. We spent hours or days or weeks AB testing subject lines, but nobody's opening. And what's happening is um, as a mature business channel, it's become a lot like SEO. And I, I think that, uh, Jeff, I know you have a lot of experience with SEO. Um, you probably remember a time where you could rank a site through keyword stuffing or through you know, backlinks or something. And there were hacks kind of, and you could kind of like get up and running and ranking sites pretty quickly. Um, Outbound, you know, a few years ago was kind of like that. You could play this numbers game and build yeah. giant lists and just see what happens. Um, now, because uh, uh, you know Google and Outlook and all these other providers have gotten smarter, um, we get less spam than we used to. We still get a lot of it, but we get less. And that means that the numbers game dynamic has changed. There still is a numbers game dynamic. You still need that scale. But if you're sending to a list of 100 people and whatever, 10, 20, 30 of them say, I don't like you, I'm going to mark you as spam, um, you're not going to be able to continue doing what you're doing for very long. So what that what that's meant is this, uh, it's, it's, it's basically increased this trend that's going on everywhere towards personalization. Um, and personalization is one of these words, buzzwords that gets thrown around a lot. I've heard it, I've heard people refer to personalization for anything, like using somebody's name as personalization. Uh, with B2B sales, the bar is much higher. You need a much higher level of personalization, um, which means strong, connections that, you know, for lack of a better word, are almost tribal for better or worse. Uh, and that's, okay. that's where, you know, a lot of what we do comes in. Yeah. So how would you use email to uh, personalize uh, three connections? I'm, I'm intrigued by that. Yeah, um, to get tactical, you know, we're always coming up with new things. And whatever we're doing now probably won't work in a few months, to be frank. Um, but uh, what what we've seen work for longer periods of time is is again channeling the old school dynamics of of, of in person networking. So, being able to put people in touch with each other uh, who already might know each other even loosely, um, and being able to you know do some form of scaled batch outreach where we're saying hey, you know we're friends with Stone, so we have other campaigns where we've found college connections. Hey, I saw we both went to X Y Z university. That's cool. I graduated this year. By the way, I'm based in this place. I'm based in Sydney. I'm based in New York. I live there with my wife and two kids. Um, uh, I saw you're doing compelling work at whatever, Coca-Cola. We're, we're an agency. We do this, that, and the third. We work with clients like these. Would you be open to a call sometime? Um, 
that is now creating a dynamic where even if somebody doesn't want to talk to you, they're not mad at you anymore. And a much bigger percentage of people are going to say, yes, let's talk or follow up with me in two weeks or, hey, I might not be the right person in the company, but I think you really need to talk to so-and-so. And that tends to be the tenor and the vast, vast majority of the responses that we tend to get when you compare that to what everyone else is doing, which is just, hey, let me pitch you on this thing and let me hope that the timing is right for this thing. Uh, and when it's not, guess what happens? People get annoyed or they ignore you or they tell you to go away. So that's where this is heading is very a very small percentage of that message is selling anyone on anything. Um, again, back to market sophistication, those levels of market sophistication at the most skeptical level, it's more about identification. That's, that's what we're focused on. Okay. So it sounds like you're creating a uh, high quality email, very targeted email with the right messaging rather than just send a hundred thousand emails. Is that correct? Correct. And, and the sort of engine below the hood of the car is all the work that goes into a coming up with that strategy, figuring out that commonality and then B identifying those people. And then, and then, and then the copy as well. So to get into copy, um, and we, we talk a lot about this, there isn't one way to do copy right. Um, Rory Sutherland is a great, great marketing thinker says, you know, the opposite of a, of a good idea could be another good idea. We've had copy that's short, that works well. We've had copy that's, that's really buttoned up, that works well. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. I think the main thing, the main dynamic that's making this work is that pretty much everybody that gets the email is thinking, okay, this person sat down and wrote me a custom email. They wrote me a handwritten email. Um, and that's, that's what's making it work. Um, there's exceptions to that. I think if you're selling the hottest new tech product under the sun, you could say, hey, we do AI influencer, this, that, and the third. And people could say, yeah, this is a canned email, but I'll still check this out because it's cool, right? It's new, I got to figure this out. Um, when you're dealing with complex B2B services, agency services, et cetera, again, bark at sophistication. Um, the differentiators, the things that make those companies different are things that are experienced after or during uh, the experience of working with you. They're not bells and whistles for the most part. There's exceptions. There, there aren't shiny objects. They're things that are experienced later. So the way that you open that door has to be different. And again, back to, to identification. So with that in mind, um, a lot of the emails that we send are very rough around the edges. You know, they look like somebody might have hammered them out on the phone. Um, there isn't a snappy call to action. Like if you're interested, click here and book on my calendar or give me a yes. Or, you know, it's yeah. like, hey, it's much, what tends to work for us more and more lately has been a much classier, almost old school approach. Like, you know, would you be open to networking informally? Uh, if so let me know, I could throw out a few times for next coming weeks or something to that effect. So a lot of the emails are getting much more older school is what we're finding. Okay. So the old is new effectively. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it's uh, a lot of it is just kind of figuring out how to use this weird contraption of the internet to do the things that have always worked, you know, and build, build trust in the ways that are kind of timeless. Yeah. I think it's a good segue then to go into, uh, I'd like to touch on, um, you've listed six different types of tools that you use, which I thought was pretty cool. And, uh, I detected, I think simplicity behind almost all of them. Um, so you use a CRM called Streak. Tell us a little bit about Streak. That's your first tool. Yep. Yeah, and I'll just give my my usual uh, kind of rote disclaimer about tools. And we're we're not oh, a yeah. big kind of like tech stack forward company. Oh. So if you find something else that works, um, by all means. And, and Streak is what we use internally. Uh, so I, I like Streak for the G Suite interface to get, to nerd out a little bit. I think. Um, What's cool about it is, is my experience with CRM is one of the hardest things is just making one thing talk to another, making data go from one place to another. Yep. And with in the sales world, um, so much of it's email, you know, that's a, such a huge percentage of the sales process is email and, and phone. Um, and Streak lives in the Gmail inbox. So I just found that to be really uh, yep. a great tool for that reason. So I think that's probably why I made that list. Okay. Um, and your second tool, because um, we, we do tools here, we're, we're we almost call ourselves tool, the tool men, uh, the tool yeah. people, um, mm -hmm. but digital tools, I think that's the other thing that's rather nice. So anyone's yeah. looking for better tools, uh, we need better hammers, we need sharper saws. Um, so email, 
you say rely.io. Tell us a bit about uh, that tool. Why? Yeah, um, so to, to give a little context on Reply, there's a lot of different email platforms. And I think that um, one of the, the bigger issues we see is when people are trying to do outbound through a newsletter platform or through like an inbound marketing platform. So I'm not sure where HubSpot's at. I know they've evolved their outbound side. So at the time of this recording, I'm not sure exactly what they're doing. But HubSpot's an example. Traditionally, they were, they were like an inbound marketing automation platform. Your constant contacts, your MailChimps. Um, generally speaking, don't don't really want to use those for outbound. Those are for like a newsletter. Um, so reply okay. reply.io uh, is cool. I, I think they have they have a lot of um, uh, they have a lot of different filters that that make things uh, you know really easy to use. Um, uh, the, there's there's a lot of other platforms though. You know I think that there's one quick mail is good. Um, you know I think as long as you're using one that's focused on outbound. Uh, then you're in the right spot. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. You made the distinction between different email platforms, ones that handle inbound and others that handle outbound. I think that's, I actually haven't heard that insight, but I think that's really, really important. And I I might do a little bit more research on that myself, just uh, because I think you might be spot on. We we use an inbound one. Um, we use Infusionsoft, sometimes called Confusionsoft. Uh, yeah. But the trouble is that once you get into uh, those ecosystems is it's hard to escape it's like hotel california um, <laughs> you can check in but you can never leave uh, right, i think that's right. the challenge um so no, tool number three that you use i mentioned is uh, linkedin sales navigator um so yeah i, I must have written this a while ago because i think that, <laughs> like, the linkedin sales navigator is like saying like oh, i like to drink water to stay hydrated or something um, <laughs> okay. so yeah i mean linkedin sales sales navigator is great if you're not there obviously get it it's worth whatever 80 bucks a month they charge i think um so what market uh, intelligence yeah. do you do <laughs> what market intelligence tools do you use now just uh, off the top of your head well, uh, it's, it's a good question. I, you know, I think a lot of what we do ends up becoming very kind of niche and contextual, okay. you know, so if we're, uh, we have campaigns now, let's see, we're going after uh, mid-sized franchise, franchises uh, in the U.S. So, you know, we might be, and then, and then combining that with finding the people that are in that, that situation. So, or that fit that demographic and also share a commonality with our clients. So we might be buying some weird niche list combined with uh, building our own data from scraping company websites and stuff. And like I mentioned earlier, drawing from a lot of different wells. So, so it does, I know it's kind of a coy, you know, sort of a coy answer, but um, it, it does become a little contextual, right? Where oh, yeah. there's, there's a lot of, you know, companies that um, misreport on LinkedIn or don't aren't, don't have a huge presence there or whatever. So there are exceptions to this. Um, but overall, I think that Sales Navigator is useful for getting a barometer on on your industry. It, it tends to work better for more public type industries, I think. Okay. Uh, more public type companies. Not, not I don't mean literally publicly traded, but you know, once you get into weird little verticals, sometimes you have to do other research. Okay. To figure out what's going on there. Yeah. So what are the other, so the fourth tool area is newsletters. Uh, how do you see newsletters and uh, what are you using today to help you create those? Yeah, um, so so in terms of a tool, I've been a big fan of ConvertKit for a long time. Um, I think it's just, you know, and they don't they don't pay us anything. So, I'm, I'm, but um, they are, you know, they, they have a lot of the automations that a, you know, an Infusionsoft would have without uh, all the headaches and so on. So pretty happy with them, but, you know, the, the tools aren't super important. I think the main thing is just kind of how you're thinking about the, the newsletter. Um, and one thing that's changed is I think in the early days, we used to try to kind of make the newsletter seem like it was very one-to-one. -one. Um, and people would believe that, you know, there was a good percentage of people that would think when you we did a newsletter, oh, this guy's writing to me. I think what's changed is, you know, people have gotten kind of smarter to that and we don't try to make it seem like it's written one-to-one. -one. But at the same time, um, what I've tried to do is just make a lot more, like bake a lot more personal stories into it. Um, it's, it honestly reminds me of a very classic, uh, approach saying, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm, and uh, you know, I'm not getting super goofy with it or talking about really personal things, but just saying, Hey, I'm writing this from this place right now. And here's what oh, I've yeah. been up to. And, uh, I, I think that that's where we're heading is just kind of getting more in, into that. And, and also just being willing to share, like, um, uh, building in public stories. Like here's what we're working on at sales community. Here's some challenges we're having. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm moving to, towards. Uh, a lot of my inbound marketing has been kind of experimental and so on. We're definitely more uh, our core competency is outbound, but it's uh, I'm having fun with it. Yeah, cool. 
yeah, I loved uh, when I read uh, your about page on your website. I learnt almost felt like I knew you um, because you told me your story, uh, New yeah, York, thank you. your travel, and uh, I think that's really important to be as authentic and tell stories. I think we've got to be better story storytellers. That is for sure, and come from a very authentic place. I think that's much more powerful. Yeah, th thanks for that. And, and I think when I was writing that, I was getting you know um, some feedback and using a friend who's really good at marketing, Taylor Pearson, who's a business coach right now, to plug him a little bit as a sounding board. And uh, I was like, uh, is this like too? Is this too personal? Is this going into stuff that no one cares about? And he's like, No, it probably means you're writing an about page that somebody's actually going to want to read. I mean, if somebody clicks on your about page, they probably want to know about the company and how it was started and so on. So, um, so so yeah, I'm glad it got it resonated. Well, I'll let you know I read all of it. So there you go. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> so it, what's important when you're chasing clients or getting building leads is uh, is follow up. Which uh, do you automate that? What are some of the tools you use to, to help you do that? Yeah, um, good question. So I, I think that once you have a relationship with somebody, which is a really weighty term for saying you've had a conversation with them, um, you don't want to over automate. And I think that. Okay. You know, the, the main level of automation is happening uh, before you've built that relationship. And from there, it's almost like there's a meter and the meter starts at 90 for, for automation, you know, or 80, and then it gets turned down to like 50 or 40 or 30. So uh, the, the, instead of automation, what I think tends to work better for follow-up is more like systems and processes and batching, yeah. right? Where yeah. you might be saying, you might be saying mostly the same message over and over to the same type of person you know, every other day, but so you might have a template that you reuse and then you're filling in a blank um, and, and going on from there. So what we recommend to our clients is we say, Hey, we're going to be getting you lots of relationships. Most of the wins are going to come from follow-up, you know, yeah. like they say only 3% or 2% or five, whatever percentage of the market's actively searching. Most people are going to need to be followed up with. So yeah. what we say is like, you know, once a week or whatever, you have an hour block that's dedicated to follow-up. If you have a CRM, whether it's Streak or a million other CRMs, make it a really simple filter that just says, hey, here's everybody that we haven't talked to in at least 30 days. Yeah. Um, and then from there, it's just really thinking about distinct campaigns, thinking creatively you know, once a week and figuring out a reason to re-engage them. Um, you don't have to overthink this. I think really great ways to re-engage are simply saying, hey, we talked 30 or 90 days ago. Um, just curious, you know, what decisions, if any of you guys made when it comes to X, Y, Z, most of the time people will say we've done nothing, you know, let's talk again. Other reasons to re-engage. Hey, we just wrapped up a project with a company just like yours. I want to, can I talk to you about it? Hey, we're rolling out this new thing. Um, and, and onwards from there. So I, I think it's more about, about that system for and batching it up. That makes yeah. It work well. yeah. Yeah. Systems and processes are very important to help you uh, scale and to keep it as simple as possible. Um, the sixth and last category of, was, uh, of tools was that you mentioned, uh, was writing proposals and, uh, you mentioned a tool called better proposals because, and you know, for the salesperson go, Oh God, I've got to write that proposal. Uh, and you don't want to have to write it from scratch all the time. So tell us a bit, bit about uh, what you recommend and what you do with proposals. Yeah, for sure. So better proposals is great. By the way, I feel like these companies should be paying us, uh, but they aren't. So. <laughs> uh, we, we, <laughs> can we can fix that. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe I, I, I need to hit them up. That's a good idea. Um, but yeah, we've been very loyal, but better proposals customers. Um, I think there's other tools that'll do this, but what's cool about better proposals is It'll, it'll track when people are opening it. So you can see, it's really cool to see like, oh, this person from three months ago is opening the proposal. Maybe I should contact them, see what's going yeah. on there. Um, and it also tells you like when, how long people are reading each, each page of your oh, proposal right. okay. and so on. So it's, it's really useful. Um, we, I used to sort of like update that thing and, you know, re, re, uh, revamp everything every, you know, other week based on sales feedback. Now we've gotten into sort of a you know a rhythm where we know generally what works and our sales process is relatively rote, but we'll make little tweaks to it. You know, we might add phrase something one way or the other, uh, and, and just based on on feedback. So, I think you know with um, with B two B sales, there isn't a lot of the data is kind of anecdotal and it's yeah. and so on. But you will notice trends, and you just want to make sure you're getting enough prospects through uh, through the system before you change anything. 
Um, I think what we've moved towards is shorter pages, you know, so it's like, it's not unlike any other slide deck. You don't want people to have to scroll too much, um, but making, you know, just kind of big poignant, here's how we think differently. Here's where, why we do what we do messages um, on each slide, you know, starting predictably with the pain, uh, how most people are doing it, how we're doing it, kind of what I talked about in this episode and then going on to, you know, investment and everything from there. What it, and what it sounds like with the better proposal is it gives you some data, even though you don't need a lot of data because you're not doing mass emails, essentially you're doing very targeted yeah. quality. Um, so it sounds like uh, better proposals gives you some data to work out what's working and what isn't. Um, yeah, for sure. And uh, I think this should be the same for, for everybody, but you know, we do, we only do proposals presentations live. So we never send a proposal before and gone over it live with somebody. Yeah. So I, th I think that's, that's important. Um, and, and, you know, but then from there, once we send it, it'll tell us how long people are spending on each slide when they're re reviewing, you know, the presentation we went over. So that's important. And what it's anecdotal, but I think what we tend to see is that, um, you know, when people are looking at the, the the investment part, when that slides open for longer, then we know we have somebody that is okay. later that's taking this seriously. Also, I know that if people aren't opening it afterwards, they're they're not interested. You know, it's not, the timing's not right. We didn't secure them, whatever. So it's it's a good signal. It does help a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. It's really good. And uh, yeah, in the past, I, you, you mentioned that you never pre-send the proposal. You always do a live one. Um, the lazy way of doing it is to send it. Go here it is. Do you, you know, choose it? Don't choose it. Uh, but you are dealing more with high ticket, complex, abstract sort of uh, sales. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, and in our main experience that I went over with uh, with that is just for ourselves. Basically, when we're selling, you know, new business services to to agencies and other B two B service companies, yeah. basically. Sure. Um, but I think our, our clients are, are doing something pretty pretty comparable. You know, I think our our clients that are better at sales that really have their act together um, are just very you know disciplined and systematic about process. So yeah. that means follow up. That means um, not reinventing the wheel each time. So most of our clients have different sales processes to varying degrees. Um, uh, a great guy, you know, a friend of mine that has a great agency, John Surakis, um, has a great digital uh, agency group as well. Um, agency mastermind. I apologize, John, if I'm butchering that. But his process that he talks about in depth on our show, for example, is like you know qualification, make sure people are fed, go over high level numbers, and then from there, it's all about uh, presenting and then strategy and then basically decision from there and ensuring that decision makers are kind of getting involved along the way and committing before going on to each stage of the process. So, you know, I think with sales, to some extent, there's not a lot new under the sun. I think the main thing that's changing is, you know, the, the mediums people are using to be sold to, like obviously Zoom and so on. We're, we're really used to that because we've dealt with that from day one. But I think it's it reminds me a little bit of that Warren Buffett quote where it's like the tide goes out and you see swimming naked. Um, when everything moved to a digital sales process, it does reveal kind of like, you know, chinks in the armor and, and issues and stuff. So um, that it's really kind of created a need to button up the sales process and get it really defined and, and, and ironed out. So that's, that's kind of the main thing we've seen. In other words, make sure your processes are nailed down. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay. So I'm over the time. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, are there a couple of top tips that you'd like to leave our audience with? And also, uh, what's the best way to contact you and your team? Yeah, um, I, I think the, the top tip is really, you know, we, we got through a lot of sales tactics and, and a lot of things like that. And that's that stuff's all important. But the most important thing is really just people, you know, you're in, by people, I mean, either, either your time, if you're the salesperson or your team, if you have a, if you have a team. Uh, and, and with that in mind, you know, time and motivation <laughs> above, above everything else, right? Because you can have the best tactics in the world, but you know, if you, if they, if they don't get implemented or they don't get stuck with, as you, as you know, Jeff, they, they fall apart. So I think really figuring that out. Um, and, and, you know, if it's just you in that seat, you might be wearing a lot of hats, but at least you can have uninterrupted time devoted to one, one type of task, I think is really important. So if you're crafting, you know, an outreach campaign, you're just working on that. You're just working on copy. Um, you're not bouncing around between things. And if you have a team, then ideally you, you can delegate and you have somebody building the list 
you have somebody else that is, you know, teeing up that meeting for you or securing it, scheduling, and then you're the one doing the thing that only you can do, you know, like talking and selling. So I think that's the most important thing is like thinking about, about who the who first uh, before getting into this. Um, and with that, um, you know, there's a lot more resources on our site. We have a, a, a live training or recorded training that was once live called, uh, and that's at saleschema.com slash relationships, plural. Um, again, saleschema.com slash relationships. And that's relationships is in like relationship sales at scales, not dating or anything like that. <laughs> uh, so people get a lot more information there or just saleschema.com. My email is dan at saleschema.com. Happy to, to connect with anybody. And um, Jeff, thank you so much for the opportunity and, and for the conversation. Thanks, Dan, for your uh, very wise and uh, well-experienced insights. You've learned a long, lot along the way, and uh, I've learned a lot today. And thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.